Well, hello friends and welcome to Ask Zach. Today we're gonna to talk about the most important Telecaster of all time. It's James Burton's 1952 Telecaster that he played on everything from Susie Q to uh, playing with Elvis and Ricky Nelson and Merle Haggard and Buck Owens and Frank Sinatra and uh, you know performed in uh, in movies, uh, innumerable television appearances and influenced legions of guitarists to pick up Telecasters. Um, yeah, so we're gonna talk about that guitar. We're gonna talk about just the various you know, iterations the guitar has been through. This 152 Tele has been uh, refinished a number of times and, until of course now it's, it's red with a white pit guard. Uh, it's kind of a departure from its black guard origins. But yeah, we're gonna talk about that. Gonna show some pictures, show uh, how James customized the guitar and how it's changed through the years until uh, its uh, current state. All right, so while you're thinking about it, uh, if you haven't done it already and you've been enjoying the show, well, please go down in the corner and hit subscribe. If you've already done that, then I appreciate you supporting the show. There's multiple ways. The best being Patreon, which you'll find a link in the description. There's also a link to askzack.com where you can find merch like this amp circuit shirt or a coffee mug. And uh, yeah, also there's good old tip jar information if you just wanna throw a couple bucks in there and I appreciate it. Well, let's dive in. James was born in 1939, and in August 21st, 1939, in Dubberly, Louisiana, which is outside of Shreveport. At the age of 13, he started playing the guitar, and his parents got him a Rex acoustic. Uh, well, actually, in some interviews, he said it's an acoustic. Others, he said it, it was an electric. But as far as I can tell, a Rex uh, was a brand used by... A, uh, a distributor, and so he, they used multiple different factories to uh, create these uh, guitars. But uh, in one interview, he indicates it was a double O or triple O size acoustic guitar, like a Martin, and that it was quite easy to play, which would be very unusual for the time. Usually, if you got a more budget model acoustic guitar, it would have been difficult to play. So other interviews, he indicates also having a silver tone guitar and then even getting a Stella that, uh, that he turned into a Dobro that he jacked up the nut on. But uh, in this same year that he's learning how to play and has at least two or three guitars, he goes into JNS Music in Shreveport, Louisiana in 1952 and he sees a brand new Telecaster hanging on the wall. And he tells his mom that he wants it. Uh, they go home, he tells his dad to, and finally his parents decide to buy him a brand new 1952 Telecaster. Now, as always, I really enjoy putting things in today's dollars so that just we have an understanding of what kind of investment that, the, uh, that James's parents made in, in young James Burton. So in 1952, a Telecaster would have been 189.50 without case. The case was 39.95 extra. All right, so let's take that into today's money. So that Telecaster in today's money would be uh, $2,100, and the case would have been $449 in today's money for a whopping total of $2,600 that's not including taxes for a brand new 1952 Telecaster with the case. So James's parents made a big investment in him and uh, I, you know, we can safely say it paid off. So the earliest photo that we have of James with this Tele is, uh, is this one. So uh, as you can tell, I mean, he looks like he's, uh, you know, looks like, you know, he got it when he was 13. Golly, in this photo, he looks like he could be, you know, 14, 15 years old at the most. And pretty soon after this, he, you know, about the age of 15, he starts playing on the Louisiana Hayride. 
that's a, a pretty big deal. At this point, he's been playing guitar two, maybe three years tops, and he is already involved in one of the big radio shows of the time. Now, we'll uh, go ahead and pull up another photo. So this is James playing again the 52 Tele, unmodified again at this point. We see an amp up front, and we see him performing with a singer. Well, that is Linda Brannon. And Linda was a young, uh, you know, performer on you know in, in Shreveport on the Louisiana Hayride, and her significance um, kind of goes way beyond just uh, being a footnote in this story. She would later on in the 1950s she would marry Jerry Kennedy, who was one of the uh, great A team you know guitarist in Nashville, who would later on become the head of Mercury Records. He would sign Roger Miller and produce all those great Jerry Lee Lewis country albums in the late 60s and 70s. And then Linda and, uh, and uh, Jerry would have a son named Gordon Kennedy. So, uh, so there's our little connection there. So, all right, but as you can see, you know, it's, uh, James has not modified the guitar yet. Well, fast forward another year or so, you get to 1956, and James has started working some with Dale Hawkins. And they end up writing a, a tune that James doesn't get credit on. He wrote the music to it. It's called Susie Q. And so it ends up getting uh, recorded in 1957 and, uh, and, and released. And uh, it starts, of course, immediately making an impact. James continues to play some with Dale Hawkins until he kind of uh, grows tired of the circuit that Dale is playing in. One of the clubs is called like the It'll Do Club. Uh, so James hooks up with another rockabilly performer named Bob Lumen. And so here we have another uh, you know, photo of, uh, of James, and this is one with Bob Lumen in the shadows. Now you can't really see it well yet, but we'll show another picture in a second. But James has already, you know, modified the guitar pretty heavily. Uh, also through his work with Bob Lumen, he gets, uh, you know, reined in or wrangled in to, uh, to be part of a Roger Corman film. So Roger Corman, uh, you know, creates a, a film called Carnival Rock and it's kind of a, uh, you know, a movie with not a lot of plot to it and a number of rockabilly performers, including Bob Lumen and David Houston, which both of them, Burton and The Shadows, are playing with, and then The Shadows even play a tune by themselves. And it's at this point we get the next photo, which, you know, it probably has been colorized, but you can see it's a close-up of James in his nice uh, shirt, and you can see that he has put his name, James, on the pit guard. And it looks like, from the last photo and from this one, both of them look as if he has painted the sides of the Telecaster black. And it looks like he's left the top, you know, kind of the butterscotch color, and then he's added his name there. So quite, quite the sharp, sharp look. So, 57 is a really big year. You have the release of Suzy Q. You have him playing with Bob Lumen. He appears in Carnival Rock. He also goes out to California with Bob Lumen, and that's where he gets noticed by Ricky Nelson, and Ricky Nelson offers him a job. And he ends up um, moving out to, uh, to Los Angeles and actually lives with Ozzy and Harriet Nelson and their son Ricky and, uh, and begins performing with him and also recording. And of course, originally he's just playing rhythm guitar while Joe Maphis plays lead, but uh, he's pretty soon uh, you know, recording lead. And of course, one of the, the big you know, moments is when he decides to start using banjo strings. And of course he's taking you know, loop end banjo strings, he's putting a ball end from another one, wrapping it up in there and using that. And the first song that they record using this uh, new set of strings that James has is called Believe What You Say. Now let's, let's come up to the, uh, the next photo. In, uh, in this one, 
you get a, kind of a little bit of a throwback. So this is is James still with uh, with Bob Lumen, but you can see that the guitar looks very different. Uh, you can see that it's a black and white photo, but you can see that something is going on with the guitar. It looks like maybe the guitar is maybe all one color. Can't really tell. All right, so let's let's go up to the next one. With with our next one, we get uh, we get Ricky Nelson. And, uh, and James. And uh, we can start to see that there's, there's, it looks like there's some paint on the, uh, you know, on, on the end of the neck. It, uh, it looks almost like there's a burst finish going on. It looks like the headstock could be painted. And then now we get the big reveal. So in this next photo, we now see, because it's in color, we can see what's going on. He has basically bursted the body red. He's painted the pit guard red and he's painted the headstock red also. And for some reason, I don't know if they didn't take the neck off when they were painting it or what, but you can see that there is red paint going across the, uh, the end of the neck, almost like as they were going, as they were painting across the, uh, you know, the top of the body, they just came down and kept going. Uh, I don't know if they forgot to, if they didn't know that you could remove the neck or forgot to tape it off. But uh, anyway, uh, you get uh, a real look of what James has done to his guitar to continue to personalize it. So you have, you know, of course, the original look of the guitar. You have the James on the pit guard and maybe the sides painted black. Now you have this whole other look that the guitar has now been uh, kind of bursted red and the pit guard's been painted and the headstock's been painted. Well, I guess he decides to clean the guitar back up and kind of go with a solid red finish. Now you have to remember that uh, a red guitar was still kind of unusual and a big deal. There's just, there's very few custom guitars uh, in the 50s or even early 60s. I mean, that's still kind of a new thing. But you can tell by 1961, James has in like you'll see in this picture where you know Ricky and uh, and James are playing together. That's on one of the videos that uh, for uh, Hello Mary Lou from 1961, and you can see that the guitar is kind of in the state that it ends up being in for the rest of its career, as it were. And so you can see that it's got a uh, at eight hole uh, single ply pick guard. It's got a red finish on the body and the neck has been cleaned up. Uh, I don't know if they were able to get the red off or they did some refinishing or what, but uh, now the guitar looks, it's a, it's a black guard with a white pick guard and, uh, and a red finish. Well, the, uh, the red finish kind of changes through the 60s and apparently he refinishes it a couple of times because he likes to have it match his, uh, his Cadillac. So whatever Cadillac he has is in the latest, newest one that he gets. He has his, uh, his Telecaster refinished in the same color. And who knows, it could have been done by him uh, to match. And finally, you kind of get up to, uh, you know, to the later 60s. And then, you know, at this point, I'm just going to say, why, again, I feel like this guitar is so important. So one, you have the Suzy Q element. That's huge. That's a, a really important album. That's an important guitar lick. Uh, two, you have the Roger Corman film, which was seen by a lot of young rock and rollers in 1957. And a lot of guys were inspired by seeing James. Then you have James playing you know, on, on the radio, on albums. Then you have him playing on television every week. And again, you have to, you have to, in your mind, you have to go back to there only being three channels on a television. And one of the most popular shows of that time period was Ozzy and Harriet show. James is on there almost every week with his Telecaster. Now at times he would bring other guitars out as props, but he always recorded with the same guitar. So we, you know, we see this guitar in its various incarnations, especially the uh, kind of red bursted finish, and then finally the red with a white pickguard look that we, uh, that is kind of the classic appearance of the guitar now. You also have him performing on Shindig. Uh, he plays with Howlin' Wolf on that guitar, 
plays with you know the Everly Brothers. Uh, he records with with Merle Haggard, his incredibly important uh, you know California albums that that he uh, you know recorded in the mid to late '60s, where you get everything from the Bottle Let Me Down to uh, you know Working Man Blues and uh, every, everything in between. Uh, you get you know work with Frank Sinatra. You get work with uh, uh, you know Buck Owens. You know this this is his his main guitar, and he's using it on all these and the Ricky Nelson stuff. You get all Hello Mary Lou, Fools Rush In. Uh, you know it's late. Believe what you say. Incredibly important guitar. By the uh, the late nineteen sixties, he has started playing some other Telecasters at times. There is a uh, a, a, a really strange uh, guitar that uh, I've only been able to find a little bit of information about it, uh, you know, just a, a photo or two. But uh, he, he had a, a Telecaster with a Strat neck and a matching headstock that he used on Shindig that had a rosewood fretboard. So that, and he also had the a maple cap Tele with a red body and a three-ply pit guard. And that's the guitar that's on the cover of Corn Pickin' and Slick Slidin'. That's not the 1952 guitar. And if you look at pictures, if you look at the album closely, you can tell that it's not the 52 guitar. The logo on the headstock's in the wrong position. It's, it's not the same guitar. That 52 telly, it, uh, it gets refinished one more time. And it gets done by Fender. And so Fender uh, offers to refinish the guitar for James. Now, uh, and uh, and they, uh, they take it... And well, James takes the guitar down to Fender and he takes his neck and all the hardware and the pickup off because he doesn't want that changed out because he knew they would do that, which is smart. And they refinish it to the, the current kind of dark red that it is now. And then he brought back the hardware and they put it all back together. The guitar kind of gets retired in 1969. So in, in 69, Fender gave him the pink Paisley Telly and I'll do an episode on that later on. But they give him that guitar, and he plays the first couple of dates with Elvis in Vegas in, 19, in the summer of 1969. He plays them with the 52 Tele. And uh, the recordings are fantastic. It's, uh, you know, it's just that guitar plugged straight into a blackface twin reverb with a JBL D120F speakers. And it's beautiful stuff. You can just look up Elvis 1969. Uh, Vegas, and and you'll get these recordings, and they're they're really cool, and uh, yeah, he uses it for that, and then he retires it, and he starts playing the Paisley. He starts playing that with Elvis and all the other stuff that he ends up doing, you know, through the uh, '70s and '80s up until his signature model is created. There are a few times where he where he pulls it out of retirement, um, evidently uh, with uh, Emilio Harris on a recording session or two. Hank DeVito, uh, Emmy's steel player, indicated that uh, the Paisley guitar was was stuck on a truck somewhere, and uh, so he pulled out the '52 Tele, and he said it was hotter, had had more output than the uh, than the Paisley. And then uh, in the in the '80s, uh, Johnny Lee did a cover of a Ricky Nelson tune, and uh, and James pulled out the old red '52 Tele. Uh, you know, of course. More recently, the the 52 Tele was on display at the Musicians Hall of Fame, and uh, J.D. Simo and I, you know, took some crazy uh, video of it. And uh, one of the r most interesting things about it is one, the frets are gone, so it's been worn down. The frets have just been worn down to nothing. It's interesting that he never had Fender refret the neck. That instead of having the guitar refretted, he just uh, went on, he, he jumped onto another telly. The other really interesting thing about the guitar is that after Fender refinished it, he pulled all the finish off the back of the body. So the, the front is red, the sides are red, but the back of the guitar is down to the raw ash. And uh, I would love to know why he did that. But that's uh, that's kind of the tale of uh, of James's 1952 Telecaster that uh, inspired so many people. So many people started playing the Telecaster from seeing him play with Ozzy and with Ricky Nelson on the Ozzy and Harriet show, or Shindig, or playing with Elvis, 
or, or hearing him play on, on so many recordings. All right, now we're gonna do two things. We're gonna do kind of Zach's book nook, and then at the end, I'm gonna have a little clip of me playing my favorite James Burton guitar solo. All right, so now for our book nook. So now we're gonna go uh, way back in time. Uh, this is a, a book that I found at, uh, you know, at a, at a used bookstore probably in the, in the late 1980s. And this is way out of print, but yet you can find it on eBay and such. It's just called the Guitar Player Book. And so this is very yellowed. I mean, it's in, it's in bad shape. But most of these interviews are from Guitar Player Magazine from the 60s and 70s, and they've never been reprinted. And by this point, a lot of those magazines are in bad condition also. So this has been a wealth of information for me, such as this, you know, there's an interview with James Burton, you know, from, the, from 1972 by Michael Brooks, which... This was extremely helpful because this is an, an earlier interview with him. But there's also great interviews with Dwayne Allman and Mike Bloomfield. And so this is really, uh, this has been a, a great resource for me through the years uh, because it just has a lot of information that's not available on the internet. This is very much worth uh, picking up. Uh, you know, you could probably find it for less than $10 on, on old eBay. But again, this is a collection of Guitar Player Magazine articles from the 60s and 70s, you know, probably going up to around 66 or 67. So, uh, yeah, quite good. Also, I need to give a note to, uh, to Steve Fischel, who, uh, who wrote this uh, wonderful interview with James back in the June 1984 issue of Guitar Player Magazine. And uh, so... That was also very helpful in uh, doing this. That's where I learned about James's penchant for uh, refinishing his Telecaster in the red color that his Cadillac happened to be. All right. Well, you're gonna. I'm gonna say goodbye, and then you're gonna see the little clip of me playing my favorite James Burton guitar solo. I hope you're well, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.